in this class uh, we will be continuing with our discussion on JavaScript. If you recall in our previous class we had talked about the basic object oriented characteristics of the JavaScript language, how it can be embedded inside an HTML document and through examples we try to illustrate some of the basic properties or some of the basic capabilities of the JavaScript language how some of the very commonly used features of the language can be used and implemented as part of some example code and we had looked at some of the examples in that regard. So, today we shall be continuing in the same way to start with we shall be looking again at some JavaScript examples which will show you how certain things can be done or implemented using JavaScript programming. So, essentially we would be continuing with looking at JavaScript examples. The first example we take today is a very important application of JavaScript namely that of data validation. In fact, JavaScript can be used for client side validation of data entered in HTML forms. Well, you try to understand one thing when you talk about data validation we are basically talking about whether the users are entering data in a form correctly or not. There can be several different ways in which you can check for correctness in this regard. For instance, you can say that in the telephone number fields you would not allow anything other than numeric digits. If it is a mobile telephone number it will always consist of 10 numeric digits. If it is a roll number for example, say it will consist of exactly 7 numerical digits and so on. A name can consist only of only of alphabetic characters and full stops possibly. So, these kind of simple rules you can formulate and at the time of data entry you can carry out online validation. Now, without JavaScript this validation could be done using a server side script. After you enter a form, you submit the form data to the server like this. Suppose on the client side, you have a form which is displayed. Okay. The user can fill in these forms and can press on the submit button. After the submit button is pressed, suppose this is your web server. The form data will go to the web server. The data that you have entered, the so called form data will go back. The web server will call some CGI script program which is stored inside it. The CGI script program will be providing data validation and will be sending back a confirmation to the user. This kind of confirmation or data validation is of course, sometimes essential. Like I am giving an example, suppose you are creating a new Yahoo mail account, email account. There at the time of registration you have to type in the name of the ID that you want. It is possible someone else has already holding that ID you are you are requesting for. So, the Yahoo server has to check in its database to find out whether that ID is already existing or is available to you. So, this check can be done only at the server side because you need to check the Yahoo database. But there are many checks which can be done at the client side even you need not disturb the server with this kind of simple checks. right? these are called so called client side validation techniques. Using JavaScript you can do client side validation. Like the roll number and telephone number examples I have taken, this checks can be very easily done at the browser end itself. Okay. So, for data validation what you will have to do essentially is you will have to extract the data entered in the form fields, you will have to, ex you will have to access them and whatever data you have entered you will have to make some checks. 
like some examples I have already given like some non alphabetic characters in names, non numeric characters in roll number age etcetera. And suppose in an online auction site you are supposed to submit a bid, but with every item there is a minimum amount of bid. So, if the bid amount is less than the minimum permissible then also you will be getting an error message. Here we show a data validation example which is essentially a student registration form where you will see that we have written a function for validation which checks whether the roll number is a 7 digit numeric value or not. This function will be submitted every time you are trying to submit the form. Okay. So, after this validation data will be sent back to the server side script. So, the example is like this. First we show the function function name of the function is valid role within parenthesis name of the field. Because in the form there may be several fields you will have to specify which field you are trying to access or you are trying to validate the name of that that particular field will have to be passed as argument or parameter to this method. Now, in the body of the function there are several attributes of this field you are extracting n size of course, you are not using in this function, but I am showing you can also access the value this tells you the size of the fields how many character this field size is. So, if it is a roll number we are expecting this n size to be 7 then the actual value of the field the field with the value attribute valid is a boolean which you initialize to true. In a for loop we will continuously be checking the individual digits of the roll number or the individual characters there can be 7 character there will be 7 characters expected. So, we are looping 7 times i equal to 0 up to less than 7. In the loop we are extracting a single character from this n val which you have taken out by calling the method substring substring i comma i plus 1 will extract a substring that will be starting at i less than i plus 1 which means a single character will be extracted at a time. So, when i equal to 0 the 0th character will come out i equal to 1 the first character will come out and so on. So, here we are extracting one of the characters from the roll number at a time and we are checking that whatever has come out if it is less than the digit 0 ASCII code of 0 or greater than the ASCII code of 9 which means this is not a valid digit. If it is less than 0 or greater than 9 it will mean that the particular character is not a digit. So, the roll number is not a valid one. So, immediately what we do we set the valid variable to false, but however we continue the loop 7 times at the end of it we check whether valid is true or false. If it is false we raise an alert invalid roll number we also display the value of the roll number here. And this is the part of the student registration form, form as such. So, you can see form method action CGI feedback as usual you specify the CGI script, but in the button type you specify a you specify an event driven action that on click you call the valid role function with this dot form dot roll number, roll number field has the name as rolleno you call this function with this parameter okay so when this function will be called the roll number will be set send here as as the parameter so so now let's see this function working so when you run this you get a student registration form so for the student you can type the name Molloy Shaha. Well, just to show you, I am typing in a 6 digit roll number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This should be invalid. Courses, I have not checked anything. Uh, if I submit this, you see immediately I get a 
prompt invalid roll number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But if I add another digit to it 7 and if I click submit again nothing comes which means the roll number is valid. So, if I type in 7 digits fine or if I add some alphanumeric character suppose I add an A in between this will also give me an alert invalid roll number 1, 2, 3, A, 5, 6, 7. So, this example shows that how by suitably writing this kind of validation functions whenever a form is submitted I can check the individual fields in the form to the extent possible and try to ask user to correct the data as far as possible sitting at the current side itself, sitting at the client side itself because some of the things as I mentioned has to be done once the data has been sent at the server side because it may need accessing and validation from the database. Database contents is not available on the client side of course, okay? fine. The next example we show is a simple example of animation. The example is like this, it displays 4 images in sequence one after the other. The names of the 4 images are they are GIF files 1 dot GIF, 2 dot GIF, 3 dot GIF and 4 dot GIF. These are the names of the 4 files and the 4 images are like this, one is a vertical image, one is a is a straight line which is slanted at 45 degrees, another the third one is a horizontal image and the fourth one is again a straight line slanted at minus 45 degrees. Now, these four images are displayed one after the other. Now, imagine what will you will see on the screen, you will see as if a line is rotating, there are four images, if you just display them pretty fast, it will it will give you a feeling that there is an animation and a line is rotating. Now, the, the example program that will show you, this will show you this animation plus it will also show you how you can control the speed of the animation. This the rate of rotation you can reduce or increase in speed by pressing two buttons, this also we shall illustrate. So, as I said here the speed of the changeover can be controlled by the user. Now, this example will show you that how we use the method called set timeout. This is the method of the window object. Now, let us try to illustrate what is the utility of this. Suppose we have this window object. In the window object, we have this method called set timeout. Now, we will see how we can pass parameters to this. Basically, what this set timeout method will do is this set timeout method actually specifies a delay. That delay is specified as an integer number that represents the delay in milliseconds right and this function is called with suitable parameters as we shall see. The effect is this a particular method can be invoked after a certain delay and that delay you can change right. So, earlier using the on click event you used to call an event immediately after after clicking a mouse. But now using the set timeout method, what you can say that well you click the method, but after one second, okay, like this you can set a delay, right. So, this example basically illustrates this kind of delay programming. This will be scheduling a piece of JavaScript code to run at a specified time in the future. As I said, you specify an integer quantity that is basically the time in milliseconds. This set timeout function can be used in a judicious way to either perform animation or other kinds of repetitive operations on some objects. Let us see the example. 
this is the full example this is the first part of it this is the second part of it and this is the body and the form. So, let us start with the body HTML document part first. Here you see in the IMG, here IMG is the tag which displays an image right, this you already know. Now this, this particular object I am giving a name called line underscore rotate, line rotate. The source of the image is one dot gif and what we are saying here the event is on load. For IMG tag this on load event will be activated every time you load an image. For example, to start with that one dot gif is what I have specified. So, whenever that one dot gif will be loaded on the screen automatically that event will get triggered also and what the event will tell the event is a call to the set timeout method. There are two parameters the first parameter is a user defined method called animate which actually will be changing the source attribute to the next image we will see how and a specified amount of delay. So, idea is that whenever you are loading an image you are also getting ready to load the next image after a certain specified period of time. This will help you create the animation right and uh, for varying the speeds of the animation you have put two buttons one we are calling slow other is calling fast. So, the slow one if you click you will be calling a method called slow fast you will calling a method called fast. Now, first let us look at the slow and fast methods these are very simple. The slow method it increments the value of a variable called delay by 25, but if it is exceeds 2000 it remains saturated there it does not exceed any further. Fast does the reverse it decreases delay by 25, but it does not allow delay to fall negative ok delay 0 is the minimum. Now, let us look at the main main function this animate and some initialization. The script language javascript it starts with an initial default delay of 2000. Number is a variable which you use for this image because, because as I said the four images are named as 1 dot gif, 2 dot gif, 3 dot gif and 4 dot gif number is that 1, 2, 3, 4 ok. So, initially since it is 1 dot gif it is set to 1 and I am creating an array and I am storing it in image sec and in a loop I have four images I am I am assigning a new image object to each element of this array. Image sec is an array of size we have not specified of the type we have not specified, but here we are saying that the type is of type image, image is a built in type. Now, in the image array there is an attribute called src source there we are putting this i concatenate dot gif. So, in this loop the first one will get 1 dot gif, second one will get 2 dot gif and so on number to start with is 1. Now, in the animate function you see what I am doing here line rotate if you recall this is the name of the image just see in this image line rotate was the name of the image attribute. So, there is a source attribute of line rotate src which means which image is currently being displayed. Now, I can directly change the source attribute of an image to load another image. So, you see that if in the animate function I go on changing the src attribute of an image then it is the same image location is the same, but the image is going on changing. So, this kind of animation I can implement very easily and every time I do this I change the number to one more number plus because I am accessing a particular element from this array and if number is greater than 4 I again set it to 1. So, let us see this program working now. So, you see there is a small arrow which is rotating 
if I press fast, the speed will go on increasing, it is becoming faster and faster. But if I press slow, it will become slower and slower, right. So, in this way you can see you can create very simple animations. The next example we look at is that of creating some simple scrolling text messages. Now, sometimes we need to have some messages scroll either on the main body of the document or on the bottom of the screen. The example that you show the scrolling will take place at the bottom of the screen. Now, here we will see we will be, we'll be using a method called scroll which is a method you can use for scrolling. So, let us see the program. This is the first part of it, this is the second part and this is the main HTML part. Now, let us start again with the HTML part. Here the text body we had set as white, background color is blue, on load window dot set tama is saying that whenever the page is loaded, this is the event, we are immediately setting a timeout on this window object and in the timeout we are specifying scroll within parenthesis s width. Well, here we will see the significance of this and delay is the amount of delay. So, with this delay you call this, then there is a message look at the status bar etcetera, etcetera. Let us see what is there in the body of the code. Message is a string which have initialized this is a welcome message. S width is the width of the string maximum by default 100 you have taken and delay also you have taken 100 if you change this value the speed of scrolling will differ. In the function scroll well the here I am not going into the details of the calculation, but actually what we are doing this is status message is initially set to null. If the starting point is greater than this s width 100 then you go on decrementing start and you again set window start timeout time scroll from start because you see when you are displaying the scrolling message there is a beginning portion there is an ending portion. If during scrolling it crosses start it will again have to start from that point. That is why what I am saying if start exceeds the width that is allowed you start decrementing start by 1 and you scroll starting from that position. This is the beginning point from where you start the scroll. Else if it is less than equal to s width and start greater than 0 these are all some calculations you can find out for the effective scrolling on the screen. I am not going to detail of this, but the place where the message actually gets displayed on the status bar is here. Status is an attribute of the window object, window dot status is whatever gets displayed on the status bar in the bottom. So, the string I calculate based on a certain point in time then I assign it to the status bar. What happens is that every time I make some modification to the message and go on assigning and modification is such that it will be shifted by one place. So, I will effectively see that the message is scrolling on the status bar. So, every time I do it I also set the timeout to again call scroll after a certain delay. So, again this continues if it crosses the other end we do the same thing. So, I am not going to detail of this let us see it working. You see at the bottom out here there is a message which is going on scrolling, right. This is a welcome message, this is the message. See it goes out, goes out, goes out and again it will start coming out here. The whole width is 100, it starts from this 100, 100 position, okay. So, this is how this is implemented, okay. Now, let us take an example which will 
talk or which will browse through the history of the pages viewed by the browser. So, here we are talking of the history object. Now, in the history object, the methods that we need to look at are back and forward. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that this back and forward methods can be used to trace through the history of the URLs of the visited pages either in the backward direction or the forward direction. So, a very simple example to illustrate this, there is a form, there are two buttons, the first button is labeled as back, the second button is labeled as forward. Now, what I am saying here is that if I click on the first button on click, I am invoking a built in method called back which is a part of the history object history dot back, but if I click on the other button I am calling history dot forward right. So, let us see this is the screen as it looks, but since it is open there is no history if I press forward and backward nothing will happen back backward will make me come back here to the previous place from where I had gone. Okay. Now, let us suppose from here I type a URL, I type the URL of the IIT Kharagpur website. So, I go to the IIT Kharagpur website, now I press the back button on the browser to go back to my original page. Now, here if I press forward, I should go back to the next page in the history, I press forward. So, you see I go back to my page here. Now, if I press back, I again come back here. So, like this in many pages when you design a page, you also have a mechanism to browse through the sequence of pages you are going through. Suppose, you have a website, you create a website where you have created some online learning materials, where you are going through the chapters or the different sections of a book. So, as you go forward, sometimes you may have to go back and see what was there previously. So, there can be the forward and backward navigation buttons as part of the page itself, which if you press will make you go back and go forward, right. Sometimes you may want to know what kind of browser the user is using, because you know that there are so many facilities or features or tags that are available in HTML, there are so many other utilities that are supported by some browsers not supported by some other browsers. So, a document which you have created it may load and get displayed very nicely on internet explorer, but it may not display properly on a navigator browser for example. So, in order to take care of this problem it would be nice if the document itself can be you can say powered with some javascript code which can check or find out the kind of browser and accordingly would expand some code or means or means write and generate some html code which can be properly handled by that particular type of the browser okay now let us see how we can do this how we can detect the type of browser that we are using now Whenever we are using this feature, the object that we are use we would be using is called navigator. Navigator is the kind of object, this traditionally this name navigator comes from the Netscape because these objects were initially developed by them, but actually navigator means a browser kind of an object. An app name and app version are two attributes of it app name actually returns the name of the browser and app version returns the version of the browser. Now, as you will see this name and the version is not just a very simple string, but a very complex string which consists in addition to the browser name and version a number of other information also. Okay. So, let us look at a very simple example to illustrate. So, I am showing only the javascript portion of the thing. 
So, first we are extracting the app name portion of navigator, we are assigning it to browser name. Secondly, we are storing the app version attribute value into browser version. Then you are checking the name, whether it is Netscape or Microsoft Internet Explorer, these are the default names of the browser name. Okay. So, if it is Netscape, then we are giving an alert hi Netscape user and concatenated with the browser version or otherwise we give an alert hi explorer user browser version otherwise we say it is an unrecognized browser. Now, here we show example here we are using, using explorer. So, we should get an alert like this hi explorer user and concatenate with the browser version. You see as you run it you get an alert here the font size is small I will show you hi explorer user 4.0 compatible MIC is Windows. Well, I, I have just inserted a document right ln after that so that you will know what is exactly shown here after pressing ok you can see it like this hi explorer user version is 4.0 compatible MSIE 5.01 these are the versions Windows NT 5.0 which version operating system it has been running. Okay. So, in addition to the browser version you get a lot of other information. Okay. Fine. The next example shows that how you can make or means how you can carry out simple password protection in your document because this, this uh, process of password protection is sometimes quite important. This is a very simple script that is being shown and actual password protection script will be more complex, more complex because you would not like to store the password in plain text as here. So, let me first explain this one, password is a variable you are defining good password is say Kharagpur, this is my good password. Then you are calling a function called prompt, prompt is another kind of uh, pop up box feature which Java supports. In prompt this enter your password is a string that you have passed and what will happen here is that when this prompt box will come there is a empty box which will be coming below it where you are prompted to type in the password. So, prompt box is something similar to alert, but something more also here the user is supposed to type in something. Okay. So, here for instance I am asking the user to type in the password. So, now the password is compared with this good password if it is equal then alert password correct click ok to un enter. If it is not correct then you are setting window location to IIT KGP. So, if the password is incorrect you are taking the user to the IIT KGP website. Okay. So, let us see it running. So, here when you run the code you get a script like this. So, here you are prompted to type in a password, Kharagpur is the password I am typing the Kharagpur, I press ok. So, I go to the page. So, this way you can create simple pages using password, but in this context let me also tell you one thing that for more complex password handling you need to do something more. That something more is like this. See here for instance I have stored the password called Kharagpur as a plain text as part of the document. Now, if you do this a hacker or an intruder can easily get hold of the password. So, this is not what you are supposed to do rather what you will be doing is that you will be using something called a one way hash function. 
what this one way hash function will do is that the password that you type this password will be sent to a function which will be generating some hash code. Now this function can be very easily written in javascript and this function can be executed at the client side itself. So what you do here is that you are not storing the password or, or you are not showing it to anybody. You are actually transforming the password into a hash code which is a cryptic code which is very difficult to you can say memorize or remember. Even if you remember it, this is called one way hash function because the reverse process is not possible. Given the, given the hash code, you cannot get back the password. So now the idea is this, instead of storing the passwords, you can store the hash codes as part of the browser. When the user wants to, wants to authenticate himself or herself, user will be typing in the password and that hash function will be computed and the computed hash code will be compared, right. In this scheme, in no way can an intruder steal the password, right. So this is what is done normally for a good password protection scheme. The example that I have taken is a very simple one, okay. Now let us look at a feature which we find quite often in many of the websites. This is called page redirection. See it happens like this. Suppose I have advertised the URL of a particular page where I, I am supposed to provide some information to a larger community of users. Now what the situation will be that this is the web site which I have advertised so that many users will be trying and accessing this website. But what might happen is that the actual information that I want to, I want to advertise, I want to share with all these users that may be residing in some other web server. This kind of an event happens quite often in many situations. For instance, uh, we also had such a situation some time back where we were holding a conference and our conference website with all the advertisements, data, everything, details that we had hosted in one of our internal web servers. But to the outside world, the URL that was advertised was some other website, not our internal website. So what could be done here? What was done was like this. In that outside website which is advertised, a very small JavaScript controlled HTML code was written whose sole purpose was to redirect the requests back to our internal website from where the actual information can be obtained. So from this diagram actually what I am saying is that whatever requests are coming, they will be redirected back to this web server. And this redirection can be done very easily in JavaScript and we shall be showing through an example how this can be done. So as I said, this is a quite commonly used feature and there one reason I had mentioned, the other reason may be there was a website which was existing, but due to some reason the website has moved to a new location, maybe due to administrative reasons the administrator has moved. So you need this redirection facility. So user should be sending requests to the previous URL, you want a means to redirect the request to the new location. Now redirection can be very easily done by manipulating the window dot location attribute. Because as I said earlier that window dot location this attribute mentions that which URL 
is presently displayed on my screen. So, if I make some changes to this URL, whatever is displayed on my screen will also change. Okay. So, for redirection I have to do this, but in addition I will also show how we can do this after a specified delay. This redirection will take place after a specified delay, the example that I will show you the delay will be 5 seconds. The example is like this. So, we have written a very small function a single line function called get going where we have set window dot location to our IIT KGP website where we want to redirect. And before doing that we are sending an alert to the user you will be redirected in 5 seconds and after the user presses ok there is a function set timeout which is invoked again. So, here we are calling this get going method after a delay of 5000 milliseconds. So, effectively the alert box will be displayed and once you click on ok you will be redirected to the IIT Kharagpur website after a delay of 5 seconds. So, let us see if this works you see that the alert box gets displayed you will be redirected in 5 seconds let me click on ok I click on ok and let me wait it should go to IIT Kharagpur website in 5 seconds you see it has gone after 5 seconds. So, this is how you can have redirection facility based on some delays this is also a pretty useful facility that you can have. Okay. Now, let us take an example where we will see how we can create new browser windows under javascript control. Now, you know that you have seen that in many websites there are so many pop up windows that come up well whether you like it or not there can be javascript code which you have downloaded along with the html document uh, you have got and that javascript code can have lines where some new windows are getting created. So, creating a new window in javascript is, is fairly easy you will have to call or invoke the open method of the window object. The syntax is like this window open has to be called with a number of different parameters the first one and the second one are mandatory the first one says you have to specify which URL you want to load on the window because just creating a window is not enough you will also have to say that in that window what is the HTML page you want to load and display right. So, the URL also you need to mention. Second one in order to refer to the window for for example, if you want to close the window later you have to give a name to the window followed by a list of optional attributes. Now, there are many window attributes which you can give I am just mentioning them width and height specify the width and the height of the window in pixels. For example, you can give window width equal to 300 height equal to 200 for example, resizable is another attribute which can be either yes or no. This tells you whether it is possible to change the size of the window later or not by drag dragging the corners. Scroll bars again yes or no whether you need scroll bars with your window if you say yes then scroll bars will appear automatically otherwise scroll bar will not appear. Toolbars again yes or no, status bar again yes or no, menu bar yes or no. So, means all these optional bars which you which you typically see on a window on a browser window when you create a new window you can tell whether you really want this this uh, bars or these features or not you can say either yes or no. And the last attribute says copy history, yes or no. copy history means say from a master window 
you are creating a new child window. If you say copy history equal to yes, then the URL history that was existing in the parent window that will get copied into the child window. If you say no, then the child will start with a null history to start with. But subsequently as you go on the history list will start growing. Okay? So, I will show an example here. Here is a simple example of a form where there is a button, a single button, the, the level of the button is new window and if you click it on click, here we are calling this window open method with some parameters. We are again, we are again invoking the IIT Kharagpur website, name is my window, width is 400, height is 200 toolbar yes, status yes, all others by default will be no, right. So, let us see this running. Let us click on this button and see what happens. So, you see a new window comes up. So, here since there are no scroll bars, I cannot scroll and see the remaining part. This is also a non resizable window, I cannot drag, I cannot get hold of the corners and drag it. Okay? So, in this way you can create windows of, of any desired characteristics. Okay. So, far in the examples we had seen, we had shown that the JavaScript code is embedded or included as part of the HTML document itself, but we will now show how we can add external JavaScript files within an HTML document which will also be loaded along with the HTML file okay, when you are loading it. So, here the point is how to include external JavaScript files from within an HTML document. So, for this we need the source or the SRC attribute in the script tag. The usage is like this, script, well language equal to JavaScript is optional I told you. So, you can have language equal to JavaScript, but in addition you can also have script equal to source dot 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 slash dot dot. This is uh, we are uh, we are basically specifying the path and we are specifying the name of the JavaScript file. So, this is equivalent to the situation where the contents of the JavaScript file is included between the begin script and end script. Okay? Both are equivalent. So, so, instead of including all the lines between begin and end scripts, you can put the contents in a file, you can store them as a file and include them using the, using the SRC attribute to link to that particular file. Okay? So, this as I said, this will behave exactly in the same way as if the contents of the specified JavaScript file appeared directly in between the tags. There are certain advantages here. Less code has to be written and stored. Well, this comes from the fact that many different pages may be having similar requirements. So, you may have to write similar JavaScript functions for a number of different HTML pages. So, instead of writing them along with each and every such document or page, if you can store or create a master JavaScript file and include it from many different files, it would be fairly simple. Like what I am saying is that, suppose you have a master JavaScript file, JS file, which you have created, which contains the commonly used JavaScript methods and functions. You can have several web pages and all these web pages can include this master JavaScript file with it. So, this will obviously reduce the number of times you need to type the same code in the different files, 
that is why we say that less code has to be written also less code has to be stored. Okay. So, as I said the commonly used code can be shared, you need to store only a single copy of this shared code on the web server. There are some other advantages, it is faster like what I am saying is that suppose here I have a client, here I have a browser, through the browser I am browsing. Now as you know that as part of every browser you can configure some local cache, cache means these are the recently visited pages or the documents from the browser in question. So, if, if a particular document is already there in the cache and if you are still wanting to access it, the browser typically will directly pick it up from the cache and not send an explicit request and get it again. This will make the access faster. Now, here what I am saying is that suppose this browser is accessing several web pages from a server. Okay. the browser will be accessing these different web pages from the server and it is possible that along with all these servers there is a common javascript file which they are sharing. So, what will happen is that when the first time the first page is downloaded this javascript file will also get downloaded and this javascript file will be stored on the cache. Now, for all subsequent page accesses, all the other subsequent pages also will be having a link to the javascript file, but that javascript file is already in the cache. So, access will be much faster, you need not have to go back to the web server every time to load the javascript file. Okay. So, this is what we mean by saying that can be cached thereby allowing faster loading of the pages. And secondly, the SRC attribute specifies a javascript file, it is not necessarily true that the javascript file need to reside on the same web server as the pages from where they are referred to. Javascript files can be loaded on a web server xyz.com, my web pages which link to that javascript file may be stored in some other web server abc.com. So, in that way this is more general, over the internet you can have a library of javascript code in one place and from all other places you can have linkages to them, right. So, in that sense this is quite flexible, so this is what I have already mentioned. There is something called javascript urls, just like you can specify a url to, to identify a particular object on the internet you can use javascript url, this is a url following the keyword javascript colon, this actually specifies that the body of the url is an arbitrary javascript code. What I mean is this, suppose you have a url javascript colon something, this something is considered to be javascript code. And if it is included as part of the URL that is directly executed in line and there is no need to have that begin script end script coding before and after it. Okay. And within this URL you can have multiple javascript statements also and if there are multiple statements they need to be separated by semicolons. Some example here javascript colon where today equal to new date, this is a javascript statement, where a new object of type date is created, it is assigned to today, colon, there is a semicolon, there are two statements, in the next statement, this is just and just a part of an html document, h2 the date is today. So, in a javascript URL you can have several such 
javascript snippets separated by separated by semicolons but what happens if such a javascript url appears in an html document what will happen is that all the javascript code will be executed and whatever is outputted by the last javascript statement that will be included as part of the html document the others will be ignored only the value outputted by the last javascript statement that will be included in the surrounding html text so some examples javascript alert good day so this will produce an alert and you can also have javascript urls as part of the href value of an hyperlink so with this uh, we end the discussion on today's lecture so now let us uh, very quickly look at uh, the solutions to the questions which we had raised during our last lecture lecture number 25 so the first question was what is the main difference between java and javascript programs with respect to their execution java programs as we had mentioned are compiled into byte code which are then interpreted by the java runtime which are typically part of the browsers while javascript programs are downloaded to the browser in source code form and are directly interpreted this is the main difference how is javascript made platform independent now all present day browsers have the capability of interpreting javascript code javascript codes are downloaded onto the browser in source code form which are interpreted so in this way javascript code can run on any platform on any browser this way they can be made platform independent given example of a javascript object and a method for instance document dot write ln if we write like this document is the object write ln is the method these are separated by dot what is the difference between the confirm and the alert methods in confirm a message box is displayed with a choice being asked from the user to press either okay or cancel it also returns a boolean value depending on the key pressed but in alert only a message box is displayed where a single okay button is there give an example to show how the value of a form field can be accessed it can be accessed as the name of the form dot name of the field dot name of the attribute like this f is the name of the form roll number is the name of the field value is an attribute of that field what does document dot write produce its output this i mentioned repeatedly this will produce the output to be merged with the surrounding html document so now some questions from today's lecture what is the purpose of the set timeout method what are the purposes of the back and forward methods in the history object how can we find out the browser type and browser version number through javascript what do the location attribute of the window object signify so in our next lecture we shall be continuing with javascript so with this we come to the end of this lecture thank you